Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so I'm, I'm tremendously excited to be here today. It's, it's great to, to be able to come to uh, you know, a, a relatively intimate event and get to sp spend time with professionals in a specific space and do this type of thing. I was lucky that I happened to be in, in San Francisco, and I've got a ton to share. So we, we, we don't have a tremendous amount of time. I do want to get through these, and I do want to have room for Q&A. And so if you are interested, you can get all of the slides right here, bit.ly slash Moz Ed Social Media. And uh, I'll, I'll have this again on the last slide in case you decide not to write it down now and then find the slides interesting and think at the end, boy, I wish I had written it down. So don't, no, no panicking. So I want to I wanna start by talking about why my belief reflects the belief of, of a lot of people in the marketing world right now, which is that content is actually the future of marketing. Someone uh, who I respect a tremendous amount recently told me that in the future, the world's largest, most prolific media companies will all be brands. It won't be the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. It'll be Red Bull. It'll be Facebook. It'll be... Uh, Unilever. And it's a little scary to imagine that world, but it's also very interesting and exciting. And I think for those of us who engage in marketing on the web, it's a critical, critical lesson. The reasons for that are pretty simple. Content drives incredible action. Content drives action like no other. I, I actually want to start with a video. So I'm going to lower the lights. Well, I'm not personally going to lower the lights, but a, a very kind gentleman in the back is going to lower the lights. We're going to watch a little video. Uh, we'll watch a snippet of the first section, and then we'll watch a snippet a little later on, just because I think this is exceptional stuff. My name is Joel Buckowitz. I'm the owner and operator of Cut Brooklyn, a small shop here in Gowanus, Brooklyn, where we make handmade knives for home and professional cooks. I lived in Brooklyn and I went to graduate school to New School University. I got an MFA in fiction writing. I had a really hard time selling the first manuscript that I wrote. When that sort of went sour and I couldn't sell my book, I just kind of lost steam altogether. I had this period of fear that I was really gonna lose writing. It was this thing that I really loved and I was afraid that it was just gonna lose it forever. I decided to take a three month hiatus from it, just stop altogether. And when I stopped, I found that I developed this need to make these sort of creative offerings on a daily basis to basically make things. When I recognized this need, I started just making stuff. A set of bookshelves, a set of canoe paddles for my dad, jewelry, tables, various things. Whenever there was an occasion, I would just go, oh, I'll make something for that, or I'll fix this at the house. And that was kind of filling that need for me. At some point, I just sort of had the idea, and I've always, I'd always kind of had a fascination with knives, that uh, it would be fun to try. So I tried it out, and it just really resonated with me. It just sort of rung in me, the idea of making something so basic and simple when I'd been working on projects that were so very abstract that would never see the light of day. And that this thing that I made would be useful, would be inherently useful, and would be around forever, and somebody would find it someday and be like, wow, I can, I can use this thing. So in a creative way, it was very much the opposite of what I was doing. The payoff was just massive, and so I was just hooked. We had this dilapidated garden shed behind our house. When I wasn't making money, cutting wood or doing various jobs, I was in there just pushing, pushing, just like hooked. I just got good at it. I found that I had a talent for it, and I got good really fast. So I was selling knives, you know, within three, four months of making my first. These were sort of sporting type knives, so hunting knives, these kinds of things. All of a sudden, I was on a year wait like that. People were waiting for my work, and I thought, man, so the, maybe I could. The thing about this. watching that video and experiencing this, right? This is a guy, failed writer, couldn't get his stories published started making knives for a living, finally found this business model that started working. I, I don't need a kitchen knife. I don't do a ton of cooking, I do a little bit. I want one of his knives so fucking bad. 
don't you? You watch that and you're like, my God, this is a knife that spent 15 hours in this man's hands. This is a knife that has gone through this story and this experience. And it's through the telling of that story that we get so excited about the product, which, let's face it, your tomato is not going to taste 10 times better when you cut it with that knife, right? You're not going to slice a lemon and suddenly it's going to, you know, start raining sugar cookies. It's just a knife. But I don't care. I love it. I want it. Content, content and storytelling builds that brand trust, that equity, that love, that inspiration that you cannot find through other means. Look, I, I have loved SEO all my life. Well, all of my professional adult life. And I've been in that industry for a decade. But I would much rather have, I would take one of these videos over a thousand top search results. I would. All of us would. And the interesting thing about this is that the, the search engines are coming to agree with this. This is Google today. And Google in years past, remember, it was 10 little blue links. Now, it's something much different. It's, it's a bias to branding that we've never seen before. Look at this. This is, this is people they want you to follow on Google+. And the only way that they built up that, right, it, <laughs> learn how you could appear here too. You know where I've never seen that phrase? In the organic search results. Never seen it. They don't, wanna, they don't want you to learn how to appear there. I mean, they, they kind of do. But they, they're certainly not going to promote it. This. Right? 2,397 people plus one that. That is branding. The only way that they got that, and, and by the way, because they have so many people plus wanting them and liking their brand and clicking it, that advertisement, that paid search ad, is costing them less than it would otherwise. Phenomenal. The power of content. One of the things that, that I personally have found about content and that, that my company has found about content is that when we hit the publish button, Thousands of people, well, hundreds of people link, and thousands of people come and visit. And very few of those, especially that right after that moment of publication, are coming through search. They're coming through, certainly, social media. They're coming through those links that have referred. They're coming through the RSS subscription, right? There's, there's nearly 100,000 people who are subscribed to the SEOMA's RSS feed, and a ton of them get that email alert right in their email or in their RSS reader. And that's through content that we've built that, right? The content on SEOmas, which, which, which Peter just kindly pimped for me. I'll make sure to hand him a 50 after this. That's amazing. And so is the power that I feel, the, the, the great sense that I get as a marketer when I publish something and I know that it's helping other people. I, I did a video recently that talked about, it was kind of a dry topic. It's you know, how to build an in-house inbound marketing team, how you should structure it when you're smaller and then grow the team. This, this was not the most exciting content that I've ever put on the web. But I had somebody just last week in Boston tell me how much they love that video, how they designed their, uh, their marketing team around that, and how three people who didn't have jobs before now have jobs there. That is incredibly fulfilling. That makes me so passionate about coming into work every day. I love doing this kind of marketing. When people talk about marketing, sometimes they talk about it like it's uh, used car salesman stuff. Sometimes they talk about it like it's, you know, attorneys t that are chasing ambulances. This kind of marketing is something you can be incredibly proud of. I, I love that it does that. And of course, content builds value in every channel simultaneously. Right? Content is helping me get more direct and bookmark traffic. It's helping more people come to my site. It's helping with the long tail of SEO and all of the search terms that are being done on the web. It's helping me grow my social media presence. It's phenomenal. It does all of this on its own. Now, granted, there's a lot of tips and tricks, and I'll talk through a few of them, but I'm not going to get way down deep in the details because what I'd much rather do is inspire you to invest in content, invest in search, and invest in social, and you'll find the tricks and tips, right? You'll, you'll, you'll figure these things out. The tactics, the individual tactics, don't matter quite as much as the investment that needs to be made here. So weirdly, there's, there's a, a meme, particularly here in San Francisco and in Silicon Valley, that social media, A, is destroying search, right? That, you know, Google, oh, that's over, so last week. Well, so 2007, right? 
Facebook, oh, that's, that's exciting, right? That's, that's really interesting and cool and fun. But these two are inseparable. And I'll show you what I mean. So this is Google+. Plus. And I, how, how many people in this room, how many people on this room actively use Google+, Plus on a regular basis? So what is that, maybe 3% of the audience, like five people out of 110, 120? Ugh. Google, Google Plus, clearly a failure, right? We can all agree, total failure? No, not a failure at all. A complete success, but an underground one, a secret success. A success that, that, the end, that Google doesn't even necessarily need the press to know how incredibly successful it's been. So this is me logged into my Gmail account. And look, I'm getting personalized results and biasing. Here's AJ Cohen, who's a great uh, SEO guy here in, here in the Bay Area. Right, and he's sharing stuff, and my results look nothing like what my results would look like if I were logged out. And you know how many people use Gmail? It's about 90 million of them, which is about 10%, a little less than 10% of Google's overall audience, and it's growing by literally tens of millions a month. Sounds pretty good to me. They don't need you to use Google+. They just need you to use something Google. They just need you to be logged in and you are in, I'll show you what I mean. So these, these 90 million users are seeing personalized results. Here's John Shahada who shared that with me. But that's kind of weird, because it usually says, if, if someone's actually using Google+, it'll say they plus one, or they shared this on Google+. But it doesn't, it just says, shared this. Here's Will Reynolds, right? He, Will shared this with me. What's going, what's going on here, right? The, Google, Google Plus is suggesting users that I should be following, even if I'm logged out. This is a logged out result where I've done a search for uh, social media and where I've done another one for SEO. My God. I mean, that, that's, that's so much better than an ad. Because e think every person who follows that account forevermore, whenever SEO models share something or plus one something, they'll see it biased in their search results. Amazing opportunity. I mean. Google Plus is giving away the traffic. If you like free traffic, I would strongly recommend that you join the people who had their hands up two minutes ago and get on Google Plus. It's, it's amazing. And here's those logged out results for news. Look, people related to it. How many people plus one this? Plus one, search plus your world is everywhere. It's already a huge part of Google. It's already for them a success enough. And by the way, if you would like to instantly have your content crawled, they built this nice feature where anything you share on Google Plus gets crawled and indexed. So if, if you're kind of worried, like, hey, Google isn't picking up my stuff, Why, how come I'm not getting my page and my content into Google? They have this new submit URL box, right? That's, that's very handy, very powerful, very fast and efficient. And it's not just Google Plus. So anything that, that gets tweeted, Google says, hey, we don't directly use uh, tweets, we don't directly use Facebook shares, but indirectly, I guarantee they do. So this is a, a URL that I tweeted that got retweeted a, a good number of times. You can't quite see it on the screen there, but it's 25 retweets. I'm a little wider than the screen is. Uh, and look, here's all these web pages that are mentioning it. Tons of them are linking. Some of them are linking with followed links, some of them are linking with no follow, it doesn't matter. Google is seeing that. They're crawling those links. This content is gonna perform very, very well. If you search this morning for uh, content curation, you will see the results dominated by an SEO Moz blog post that went out this morning from um, one of our associate writers who is an Italian guy working in Spain who wrote this post and it got tweeted all over the place. This isn't just true for Google either. Facebook is doing this with Bing. And, and Bing is using this very heavily, so here's my friends Joanna and Peter, and here's the restaurants that they like. Clearly this Miro tea place must be amazing. There's Aaron Wheeler, one of the guys on my help team at Moz, and he likes Tech Flash, so anything with their results gets shown higher up. Search, social, basically one. And this, this is the hardest to find page. This exposes the secret of Google Plus's success. If you're wondering why Google Plus is working, it's because of this page. How many of you have Gmail accounts? Okay, almost everyone. In fact, pretty, pretty much everyone. Go to this URL. You will be blown away. Blown away. This is what it'll show you. It will show you how you are connected and how Google's connecting you to everyone in your social network, and it's not just through Google+. 
look at this. Tony Adam happens to have a Google profile. It connects to all these places. They therefore know pretty much everything about Tony, and they will show you his Flickr, his lanyard, his Twitter, things that he's shared. You can see this. Let's go take a peek here. So here's my Google Plus account. Uh, this is a hard to find page, so I'm gonna show you how to find it. Social connections, whoops. Google social connections. It's in one of their help documentation pages, and I think it's at the bottom of the page. Aha, my social connections page, which by the way, you cannot reach through the little like drop down in the top right hand corner for your Gmail. But here I am. So my direct connections, the people I've actually emailed with, I don't use this Gmail account. Like I literally don't use it. Haven't replied to an email on there since 2007. I'm only connected to like 34 people. But through those 34 people, they've connected me to another 1,800 people. Watch. Oh my good God. Are you seeing this? Has your mind exploded yet? Excellent. Mind explosion is one of the specialties. All right, now. I, I mean, apart from the fact that Google doesn't yet have microbots floating in the air listening to every conversation that we've got, they pretty much know everything that's happening on the web. And this whole, ah, oh, we don't use Facebook directly, ah, oh, we don't use Twitter directly, ah, oh, Google Plus, it doesn't have that much engagement, lies. This is the truth. The truth is search and social are already one thing. And it's not just the primary direct influences, it's all the second order stuff too. I, I mean, the thing about Twitter is that it can spread a message to everyone in just a few hours. Do you guys remember when Keith Urban, who used to work for the Bush White House, tweeted that, what did he say? Uh, oh my God, I heard they got bin Laden, right? And that tweet looked like this. That is the spread of that tweet. Now, now Keith Urban was followed by a little over 400 people. So we're not talking about, you know, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson or even better, Neil Patrick Harris, right? Like tweeting this and getting, who's the, Ashton Kutcher, right? He has like three million people following him or something, right? This, this went out from one, one lowly guy and before President Obama spoke on stage, nearly everyone in this country knew what he was announcing. Has that ever happened before? That's nuts. Newspapers could never do that. Radio and television can't even do that. That's, that's amazing. And social doesn't just drive awareness, it, it also drives queries, right? Social influences search indirectly because as things get social, this, for example, is a company called Dollar Shave Club. I'm gonna show you a video from them in just a little bit. It's an awesome video. Some of you are already smiling and nodding. Cool, hope you don't mind watching it again. And they launched, what, about 13 days ago, two weeks ago, and Boom, their traffic has gone crazy. So SEO Moz gets a few hundred searches for just our name each day. And these guys are getting a few thousand after their launch, which by the way, I will, I will also show you they, they didn't exactly do a whole lot of SEO with that. Those queries also influence the ranking. So Google is looking at what's happening in search, in search volume, and then they're taking that and showing you different results based on it. I'll, I'll give you a, a very good example. When Keith Urban sent that tweet, Within a few minutes, Google was already showing news items around bin Laden being killed because they knew that bin Laden's searches were spiking based on this tweet and the sending of that tweet around the web. And amazing, right? I mean, remarkable that, that Google can pick up on those kinds of signals. Bing, Bing does it too. Uh, social also yields lots of press, right? So when something goes hot in the social sphere, we can see the press picking it up, that leads to links, that leads to more queries, that leads to more social activity, all sorts of beautiful things. And, of course, it brings in links which benefit you directly in the search results in the long term for, for all the kinds of things you wanna rank for, right? So, uh, if I'm talking about how do I strategically think about this connection between content, search, and social, the way that I, that I think about this from a marketing perspective is right here. I think, okay, I'm gonna go create some shareworthy content, gonna share that content socially, I'm then gonna earn the rankings boost that I get from having that social content shared, it's gonna earn natural links from all these different sources, right, then I'm gonna get more social followers because more people are checking out my content and subscribing to me and plus wanting me and Facebook liking me and sharing me and Pinteresting me and then, 
next time I share, my network reach gets amplified, and that means more people are gonna be search biased to seeing all the stuff that I want. So I don't just get the temporal traffic of social that is, might, might be relevant, but might not be particularly relevant, but I also get the hyper relevant, high converting organic search traffic, which by the way, doesn't cost anything. And then I get to do what I always wanted to do. <laughs> Isn't that what we all want to do? I know you're thinking, yeah, it sounds kind of fishy a little hard. Let's see a real life example. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of dollarshaveclub.com. What is dollarshaveclub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. So Dollar Shave Club launched that video 13 days ago. We just saw on the YouTube page that it had four million views. Just seven days ago, I took this screenshot uh, when it only had, well, it's, not, it's not right on here, but it only had about three and a half million views. So they are continuing to rapidly expand and this is flying across the web, right? What did we just watch? It was an advertisement, right? I mean, it was like a promotional ad. But it wasn't. Nobody paid any money to put that ad on a television program or to show it in front of people or to interrupt someone's web surfing experience with that. They just put it on their website and they launched with some nice press on typical startup type places. Now, I mean, let's be honest here. This is a crazy startup. There's no technology here, right? I mean, the blade does, isn't, isn't magically 10 times better than any other blade out there. Their shipping process is not particularly good. In fact, uh, after this launch, they got so many orders they couldn't even fulfill them all. I'll show you in a sec. What they, what they did right was content marketing. And by the way, they also did a phenomenal job with social. So they got tons of people to follow them on Twitter and to tweet about it. And, you know, tens of thousands of retweets, tens of thousands of shares and likes on Facebook and, you know, millions of views on YouTube. Uh, th th there you go, right? Three or three and a half million a few days ago and now four million today. And of course, if I search for anything and I'm logged in, boom, it's going to be all over the place, right? There it is. There it is. Uh, there it is again. Amazing. It's all over the place, but, but, if I'm logged, uh, it, it also earned tremendous amounts of links. So these are all thousands of people who are linking to and embedding the video and talking about Dollar Shave Club all over the web, right? Just from the past week that I've selected there. And here you go, uh, uh, big old fail, right? Dear soon to be member, last week the internet came to visit. And as a result, we're unable to fill your order until May 15th. So I, they won the internet, right? Like they definitely did. They couldn't handle the win, but, but they won the internet. Unfortunately, they did no keyword research, 
no keyword targeting, no embeddable videos so that they earn links back with the ones they wanted to control, no SEO. And so the, the sad part to me is that months from now, when the video has been sort of expended its viral life, they won't have those hundreds, thousands of searchers each day coming to their site looking for men's razors, men's shaving kits, men's razor blades, right? Unfortunately, they don't, they don't rank for any of that stuff, which is very frustrating for a guy like me, right? It just gets me all angsty. So uh, let's talk about some of these tactics, specific tactics, because I, I, I do get very excited about the big picture, but then I know people need to do some cool stuff. So let's start with content. This is an infographic. You have surely see them whenever you stay in hotels on the front cover of your USA Today, right? And they are very effective because as human beings, we are lazy consumers of information and we love when someone turns a bullet point into something like this. And that is literally what this person did. They took a bunch of bullet points and they turned them into a graphic. And of course, this is gonna get shared, a list of bullet points, not so shareable. This is a genius tactic for, by some friends of mine up at Urban Spoon. They knew they had to compete with Yelp. Yelp is very tough to compete with. They had this great SEO company I heard who helped them out years ago and worked with them for a long time. I don't, I don't know what the name of that company is. But it was SEO Moss. Uh, but you can see here that what they've done is totally genius. They have said, hey, these are the blogging leaders in the foodie sphere. Do you know what happens when you tell bloggers who number one is? They all link to you. They go crazy. Do you know what, I mean, what it, it, it is to be a blogger is to essentially be someone who has a deep cavity inside one's soul that desires tweets, shares, links, and mentions. It, it, it is all consuming. You must have it. And this, this is fulfilling bloggers' most strong desire, which is to be notable, to be mentioned, to receive attention. I am sure that tons of you who are in the education sphere, right, have an opportunity to do something just like this and earn massive amounts of attention from bloggers in your sphere. And by the way, you know what you can do is try and update this every month so that they never feel comfortable, right? They have to keep paying attention to it and tweeting about it and blogging about it and writing. This is OK Trends. OkCupid okay is a company that, that is trying to rank for online dating and free online dating and they're, they're very good at that, actually. Well, eventually they got very good at it. After they launched a blog, a data blog, about trends and tactics that they took away from the information of people sharing. So this, I know, you can't, you can't quite make it out, but this is the distribution of uh, how attractive men find women. Men tend to find women very attractive, like all of them, right? This, this distribution curve is like, uh, is it a woman? then it is attractive, right? That is, <laughs> well, okay, all right. And this, this is the dotted line, right? Guys, we, do, you, do you see the least attractive? I'm sorry, gentlemen, but if you're a man, women do not tend to, on average, find you attractive. Like, you are, you're not, you are not attractive, as, right? <laughs> have, have male characteristics, sorry. But, but, I have good news. Because when OK Trends looked at this, they then looked at the distribution rate of messages. And you know what they found? That men disproportionately message the most attractive women, but that women disproportionately message less attractive men. <laughs> it's not so bad being a little funny looking like me, right? I can get by. The genius of this is they put it on the web, right? They take their data, they put it on the web, they share this transparently, and my God, you have never seen anything like the links that they won. And as a result of this, not just this post, but a lot of posts like this, they now rank number one for online dating and free online dating, which are two of the most competitive and highly commercial and valuable terms on the web. Genius content marketing. Everybody else who tries to compete for those terms, but not everybody, but nearly everybody else is a spammer. They are like buying links and doing hacky, nasty things, and they are winning with content, bless them. The thing about content is, if you don't produce exceptional content, I don't mean good content, right? You hear a search engine say, you should make good content, and then people think, okay, well, I run an office supply store, I shall write about the new typewriters we got, well, the new paper clips we got in. 
no, no, that's, no, that's terrible, that's not going to work at all. But if you can show that different industries are buying different types of office supplies and that there's a weird misformed distribution between uh, people who are still addicted to printer ink and those who are running, you know, uh, uh, e-offices, well, that's going to go in the news and that's going to be written about in the press and that's going to be written about on, online by bloggers and that's going to be shared all over the place and you can win with that. Some Google Plus tactics. The weird thing about Google Plus is that when you share stuff, what you think is, oh, there's like 20 people following me on Google+. This is useless. I'm not going to get anywhere. You're wrong. Google has something called extended circles. So when I tweet something, the only people who see that tweet, there goes my microphone, the only people who see that tweet, right, are the people who follow you on Twitter. But that's not the case on Google+. Anyone who follows you and anyone who follows anyone who follows you Right? You get like a, a one extra circle distribution. So long as you have somebody following you, boom, you win that way. If you want to find people who are influencers on Google+, there's this great tool called Find People on Plus. I encourage you to start doing some searches for the types of people who you want to influence. And you know you can send them direct messages. You just put plus their name and you can share something with anybody on Google+. They don't even have to be following you. Right? You can say like, oh, dear person who is very important and high up at company that I really was, would like to reach, who happens to be on Google+, I have this thing for you, and it'll show up in their notifications, even if they're not using Google+, even if they're just logged into their Gmail. Uh, you can do this through the, you can see these through the mentions of your name, and you can tag other people uh, through the, co the comment share system there. If you want to see who's really good at sharing on Google+, check out Ripples. I've got a link here. You can watch a Ripple for any URL on the web. You can see how it's shared, who shared it, where it went via Google+. It's very, very cool because then I can see, oh, look, I shared it. And then who's this? I don't actually know Thomas Morphew. Maybe I do know him, but look, when he shared it, other more people shared it again. I should really get in touch with him, right? He seems like he's a good sharer. Uh, and Google+, since they use Gmail, you see where I'm going with this? My God. If only our email newsletter was sent out via Gmail. If only I emailed all my customers through my Gmail account to their Gmail accounts, then they would all always be biased to seeing my stuff. The social network is via email. So some Twitter and Facebook tactics. Uh, lots of people ask me all the time, how do I get more people following me on Twitter? In fact, my wife asked me this just a couple weeks ago. She's like, okay, I want to get more people following me on Twitter. Right? I, she's a travel blogger. And, and I said, aha, you need Dan Zarella. This is the uh, social media scientist who works at HubSpot out in Boston. And he puts together awesome studies of data looking at what gets people to follow people and what gets people to retweet people. And you can see here, if you tweet good links, you will do well. If you tweet great links, you will do really well. Because links are really the currency of what gets shared on Twitter. Uh, you should also use proper timing. This is the most horribly named product uh, in the history of social media tools. It's called Twiriad. Um, but it does help you with proper timing. So you can see here that I ran my uh, personal Twitter account through it, and it's showing me the best times each day when I have the most followers online actively using Twitter, and so that I can know when to time my tweets to share with them. Uh, and by the way, don't be shy. You can go ahead and ask for people to help you spread messages. Uh, when Dan looked, Dan Zarell again, looked at the most retweeted words and the most retweetable words, what he found is, please retweet, and retweet, please, and uh, RT. All of those things are incredible in getting more retweets. So consider it. Uh, you can also, by the way, use uh, Big Door and Pay with a Tweet, which give you these gamified processes where if you want access to a particular type of content, you need to first tweet it. It's super, super effective. This is one of the things that, uh, that was inspired by OK Trends, the blog I was talking about previously. So this is a little drop down. You scroll to the bottom of the page of any OK Trends blog post, and this little black bar will roll over the top of the content, over the top of the screen using a CSS layer, which is essentially like, oh, did you just finish reading this? Well, now it is time to share. They're not asking you during the process, right? They don't have share buttons all over the place. They're not bombarding you with them. They're doing the smart thing. They're asking you right when they know, right when you know that, hey, I just finished this article. 
Now it is time to share. Fantastic, awesome. And there's a WordPress plugin for this now. Uh, finally, I'll talk through just a couple of integrated tactics. One of them is that when you leverage social channels to share things, you get search volume. You should be very prepared to handle this. And you need to curate it carefully. So this, this is the Dollar Shave Club. This is a trend via uh, Google Insights, which is a cool little tool. It'll show you search volume over time for all sorts of things. right? And you can see there, hey, wow, look at that. There's, there's that social spike. So if I can share socially, I get branding and I get search volume, and then I better make sure that I have a great listing in the search results and then I rank first for whatever I'm socially sharing. There's also this cool, cool thing that Google now offers called rel equals author. If you set up Google Plus, you can use this rel equals author to trigger these types of results. The click-through rate on these is phenomenally higher than it is on normal results. And it's, it's not that hard to set up. Here's a, here's a great link on how to do it. Uh, the wonderful thing about this is that the, the, the profiles themselves give you additional branding too, right? Like if I see AJ five, six, seven times in the search results and I like his results every time, I'm always gonna be looking for his content. And by the way, if he uses the same picture, which I would highly advise him to do and which he does, use that same picture on Twitter and Facebook and all these others, it's gonna do great. Uh, you can also do this with video content. This is one of the things that makes me really upset with Dollar Shave Club because they didn't do it, but they could. This is a video and see how it, See how it's like this? We, had, we actually had a listing where we had the, the first, second, and third result. The third result was a video, and that third result with the video got more clicks than result one and two combined. Oh my God, super powerful. So th this is how to get those videos into those results. You can use any video service you want, except YouTube. YouTube if it's YouTube, Google kind of wants to own that video snippet themselves, I don't know. But, but. You will also need to be really careful when you're investing in all these channels Right? I'm, I'm talking about a very multi-channel approach to marketing on the web, and your analytics is going to tell you dirty, dirty lies. Right? What they're gonna show you is, let, let's imagine a process here. I click on a mention on Facebook, I see something from a tweeted link, I go to a video from a search query, I see a retargeting ad and click that, I see a brand search query, I see an RSS link, and then maybe I do a, a, a search, and, and then, then I buy, then I convert. What is my analytics gonna tell me? It's only gonna tell me about this one, right? It's gonna say the last thing that this person did before converting, only the last way. What about all five of these? No credit whatsoever, nothing, crap. This is a lie, right? These all clearly influence this conversion and all sorts of things that happen in these phases of the funnel before this phase didn't get the credit they deserved, which is why you have to, have to, have to use multi-channel attribution. This is actually me doing this for SEO Moz. I know it's a weird visualization. I was just trying to come up with something. But you can see that I'm taking direct traffic and referring links and social and then splitting them up and looking at, well, what happens for people who come via first time versus 10 visits versus made at least one visit prior to the conversion versus the last touch before conversion. And you can see the distributions here are way different than the distributions up the channel, up the funnel, right? And so because of this multi-channel, becomes essential, and this requires some fairly sophisticated technical marketing, unless you just want to do it this way, which is, which is kind of a hack. I just looked at first time, return, four plus visits, 10 plus visits, and I made it myself. So my, my goal, my quest for the last couple of years has been to take my love for SEO and set it aside for a little bit and say, you know what? The way of the future is a little bit broader, a little bit bigger than just pure SEO. And I'm gonna have to combine all of these different tactics, all of these different ways to get visits, all of these different ways to influence people on the web organically if I'm gonna win. So thank you very much. There's the link to download it. Look forward to some Q&A. Uh, so a little different, it's actually the uh, share. Here, let's take a quick look. Right, so uh, if I go to Google Plus, for example, I would need to share a link in here. That's what'll get it instantly crawled and indexed. If I just go, I mean, if I go to something that's already been shared and I just plus one it, that, that doesn't 
I mean, that might help rank a little better and might bias it to other people seeing it more, but it's, it, it was already uh, indexed because whoever this is shared it. Um, No, not, not at all. I mean, the, one of the, Google Plus is very much like Twitter. You, you could certainly overshare, right? You could put stuff in there that would make people go, God, this is really annoying. But if you're only producing a piece of content every day or a few every week, this is a fantastic channel to be sharing through, uh, even if you think you only have a small amount of engagement on there. Uh, it does have to be an individual. It has to be a human person with a, a Google Plus profile right now. Uh, however, you can have multiple authors set up on there. So for example, if you, if you run one website and you've got 10 people who are contributing content, every one of those can have their own profile and, and those can all link uh, through the rel author rich snippet format. Right, exactly. So they basically, here's a little badge. By the way, you're a top 10 blogger in London, you know, food blogger in London. You can put this on your site. Here it is in several formats. You know, nowadays it'd be very easy because you'd just tweet at them, but this was sort of prior to Twitter's uh, blowing up. A another great tool, by the way, for finding those people, if you want to particularly get in touch with them, is a, a service called Follower Wonk. It's completely, totally amazing. In fact, um, what, what, what would be like a common term that someone who blogs about education uses to describe themselves? Educator? Educator? Cool. So this will search through 100 million Twitter profiles and show me, in order of who has the most followers, the people who use the word blogger and the word educator to describe themselves. Ta-da. Totally amazing. I mean, like, this is the search engine I always wanted as a marketer, and I just love these guys. Out of Portland, by the way. Really, really cool service. So. What's gonna happen is I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom of this article, read it, it's very interesting, it's fascinating, right? Is it better to smile or not to smile? Effective man's facial attitude versus women's, popular female photo, da 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, abdominals actually do really well. I don't know, if you have them, flaunt them. Uh, not in that world, okay. Ta-da. Do you see what happened when I reached the bottom? They just, whoops, let me go back up. It'll roll away. And then I roll over and it goes, hey, send it to your friends. Like it on Facebook. It's brilliant, I mean, I, I can't, so they actually did tons of rigorous testing to figure out what social share format was gonna work the best, and this killed everything else. Just was clearly the best. They used to have it, by the way, where they had Facebook and Twitter and a couple other ones. And they destroyed that because they found that people who date tend to be on Facebook more than any other platform, and they'd rather have the Facebook sharing because that was sort of the best customer channel for them. So, I mean, combining these tactics with a bunch of rigorous testing and conversion rate optimization, all that kind of stuff is mwah.